On behalf of Carolyn and I, I'd like to express how much we appreciate you, uh, your love, your words of encouragement, your warm reception, your kind hospitality. Uh, it's just been a blessing to be back here at Vestavia once again. Uh, this afternoon, I'd like to bring your attention to a verse in the 119th Psalm. Psalms 119, verse 18 says, Open thou mine eyes, that I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. The 119th Psalm is just one of 150 Psalms, but it's uh, somewhat unique. It has 176 verses in it, which is the longest Psalm by a long ways. If you just look at the Psalms as chapters, it'd be the longest chapter in the Bible. We find 172 of these verses pretty much are short prayer request, And 171 out of the 176 verses has reference to God's word one way or the other. And one way or the other, God is referred to in every verse of the 176 verses. Also, the 119th Psalm is divided up into eight sections. There are, excuse me, 22 sections of eight verses each. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And each one of these 22 sections begins with one of those letters of the Hebrew alphabet alphabet. So some of the uniqueness of this particular psalm. The main theme of this psalm is the scriptures. The main theme is the word of God. God's word is how God communicates to us. When we pray, we communicate with God. So we pray, we pray to the Lord. And I don't know if you ever think about it or not, but you know, I could not get on the telephone and call the mayor of Goodlettsville and get him, I'm sure. I couldn't get on the telephone and call the governor, expect to get him. I certainly couldn't call the president of the United States, although I'd like to at times, and talk with him. I'm sure of that, but I can call heaven 24-7. I can call the Lord anytime. It doesn't matter where I'm at, what's going on, what's happening. I don't have to be put on hold. I don't have to think about getting a busy signal. I don't, have, you know, uh, get another voice talking to me. Um, I know I can call upon him 24-7, anytime, anywhere, and I can get him. Isn't that wonderful? I can call upon him as my father as well as my God. So in this 119th Psalm, we find one of those prayers I was talking about. Again, in verse 18, David says, Open thou mine eyes. Thou might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Now, the word law just simply has reference to the scriptures. It doesn't have reference per se to the law of Moses, say. Uh, the word statue, testimony, commandments, word, law, or just some of the words. I think there's basically eight words that's used, and each of those eight words are used at least 20 times in this 119th Psalm in reference to the scriptures, God's word. So we pray to God, but God communicates to us in the Word of God. And the Scriptures are available to us. You know, unlike any other time in history of mankind, uh, you can buy an $8 Bible, and it's got the same words in it if you spend $250 for a Bible, as far as the content, as far as the words is concerned. So it's easy for all of us to have one. And we should use it more than just decoration on the coffee table, you know. <laughs> um, we should read it on a daily basis. So this really emphasizes, the theme of this psalm really emphasizes God's word. He said, Brother Ronald, uh, give, me, give me one good reason why I should read the Bible. I'm, I'm going to give you 176 of them. 
Okay, not not everyone in this afternoon. <laughs> All you got to do is read uh, these 176 verses. You'll have 176 reasons as to why you should read the scriptures. You know, in First John chapter one, John says, "These things we write unto you that your joy may be full." Well, there's joy in if you read what John wrote. If you don't read what John wrote, the joy that he has for you and what he's written, you're not going to receive it. Like I said in the book of Revelation this morning, blessed is the man that readeth, and they that hear, and they that keep the sayings of this book. So there's just this heavy emphasis in the importance and the benefit of this psalm here, emphasizing the scriptures. We find where David says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He said, Thy word is sweet to my taste as honey in my mouth. But here he's praying to the Lord that the Lord might open his eyes that he might see wondrous things out of his law, that is, out of his word. Now, God is a specialist in all, all things. Somebody says, Brother Lawrence, what, what, what's your doctor's name? I said, well, which one are you talking about? I got about eight of them. <laughs> you know, used to, you had one doctor. Now you got a doctor for everything. You got specialists. But when it comes to the Lord, there's just one physician, and he specializes in everything. Uh, you know, he specializes in whatever you have a need of. He, he just specializes in it. And um, people, you know, take all kinds of vitamins and one thing and another. And I take three or four, but uh, I just refuse to increase that anymore. The only real vitamin I like to take is, is the, uh, you know, the gospel. I like the gospel. The, the gospel has all the vitamins I stand in need of. It has all my spiritual nutrients in it. It has everything I stand in need of in the gospel. So I try to take one of them just every opportunity that I can, you see. But open thou mine eyes. Well, this is not a request by somebody that's not been regenerated. The unregenerated man is not going to pray to God for God to open up his eyes. The unregenerated man, of course, doesn't have eyes at all. And we look over here in John 3.3 3, where the Lord taught this lesson to Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see it. You have to be born of the spirit to be able to see this here. So he sees not. You know, uh, man in his depraved nature has what I call the cannot disease. Just so many things he cannot do. John 5 and uh, 40, I believe it is, the Lord said, you will not come unto me that you may have life. John 8, 43, the question is asked, why do you not understand my speech? And because you cannot hear my words. Man sees not, he hears not, uh, he understands not. 1 Corinthians 2, 14, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for the foolish is unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Romans 8, 7 says, uh, uh, he that's in the flesh cannot please God. So he sees not, he hears not, he will not, uh, you know, he pleases not, whatever. He just got this not disease. And uh, the only uh, cure for the not disease is grace. That's the only thing to cure him. There's no, no, other, no other source, no other, other medicine he can take. It's, it's the, you know, the medicine of grace is the only thing to take care of that. So this is not a prayer of an unregenerate person. This is a prayer of somebody, I believe, has already seen some wonders in the law of God, and he wants to see more of them. And he wants to see them with greater clarity and greater depth. Open thou mine eyes, O Lord, that I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. See, God is, a, a, is an eye specialist. God, is able, God can enable somebody to see that can't see in many different categories. Uh, you take uh, Saul of Tarsus. He's on the Damascus Road, Acts chapter 9. He's on the way to Damascus to persecute the Lord's children. He's got letters of authority to do so. But on that way, we find where God arrests him. And he strikes him down at noontime. And we're going to find on that experience that Saul, when he opens his eyes after that experience, says he could not see anybody. Now, he could see. He struck down. Now, he can't see. And he goes on to Damascus, and Ananias approaches him, says, Brother Saul, and when he said that, he said it fell from his eyes. There had been, you know, scales upon his eyes, and they fell away. Now, he can see. So God enables a man who could see not to see and to see again. He's just an eye specialist. In John chapter 9, 
There's a man who is blind from his mother's uh, mother's womb. Here's somebody who has never seen. He's born blind. And this is a pretty interesting chapter to study and read. It's a pretty lengthy chapter. But you see, this man went up against all the so-called experts. This man uh, was able to defend himself against his neighbors, defend himself against the Pharisees. When they came and questioned him how he could now see, he, he just had an answer that was based upon common reasoning, common sense, and his own experience. Till he finally reached a point where he says, listen, there's one thing I know. He said, once where I was blind, now I see. And that's all he needed to know. His experience was enough to get him through all that, you see. So here's a man blind from his mother's womb. He'd never seen anything, but that didn't hinder the Lord from giving him sight. In the last part of Mark 10, you got two blind men. But Mark zeroes in on one of them. His name is Bartimaeus. And we mentioned him from time to time, blind Bartimaeus. Now, I believe that Bartimaeus had been able to see earlier in his life. But now, for whatever reason, he's blind. And he and another blind man are sitting by the wayside as Jesus comes walking by. Uh, and they hear about this. And uh, they're outside the city gates of Jericho. And uh, they cry out to the Lord. Uh, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon us. That was a messianic phrase when they said that. Have mercy upon us. And the Lord stood still. And uh, I'm thankful that the Lord, who's the busiest man in all the world, I believe the Lord and Jesus Christ had more to do than anybody who's ever lived upon the face of the earth. I don't think Jesus ever had an idle hour, idle minute, idle second. I don't think you ever find him sitting on the front porch rocking with a, a stick and a, and a knife in his hand, whittling away. Uh, Jesus never took a vacation. Uh, Jesus, as far as I know, you know, never did anything just for pleasure. And yet Jesus had time to stand still. Now, a lot of times people don't have time anymore to stand still. We live in an age of time-saving devices, yet we don't have time. That's, uh, can't quite figure that one out. You know, uh, this will save you time. This will save you time. This will save you time. <laughs> and yet we have no time to save. Uh, but anyway, uh, the Lord stood still for him. The Lord stood still. And the Lord has stood still for me many times. And I believe the Lord has stood still for you. And I'm telling you, the Lord will stand still for you. When you cry out like blind Bartimaeus did, the Lord will stand still for you. And so he did. And they brought him there. The disciples actually wanted Bartimaeus to be quiet. Uh, the disciples just misunderstood. I think sometimes they thought the Lord was uh, too much of a VIP, you know, to have time to stand still for people. And a lot of VIPs would. But, you know, we're all VIPs. I don't know if you knew that or not. Every single one of us are a VIP. Because V stands for vanity, I for ignorance, and P for pride. And so we, we just, we're, all, we're all VIPs in that regard. But the Lord stood still for him and asked him, said, what would thou do us for thou? And he says, that I might receive my sight. And the Lord said, thy faith hath made thee whole. And he gave him his sight to him. And the Bible says then that Bartimaeus followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's what I need to do. It's what you need to do and God's children need to do when they realize that the Lord has dealt with them. They need to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in the pathway of discipleship. See, Jesus is a, an eye specialist. He knows how to open up the eyes of people. And yet, I read over here in the 24th chapter of Luke where the Lord, after his resurrection, is walking on the road to Emmaus. And there's two other disciples walking on that road. And Jesus just kind of joins himself up with them. And uh, when he does, they're talking, they're in conversation. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing sometimes you just be quiet what you can hear others talking about. I was uh, telling Karen uh, just a few days ago, I was uh, playing pickleball with these people. And uh, there's two ladies on the other side of the net. And while we're warming up, they're talking about uh, uh, their, their lives. And one says, well, I've never have been married. And the reason I had been married for this, married for that, and one thing or another. And the other one says, well, I was married, and I was divorced, and this, that, and the other. I mean, they're just going back and forth, which, you know, finally, I, I got an opportunity. I says, well, I've been married for 53 years. And, and they said, well, that, that's great. I says, well, it works for some people, apparently. I said, yeah, it worked for me. So the Lord's over here in this conversation. And they don't know who he is because the Bible says their eyes were holding that, that word holding means to seize. It means to arrest. Uh, the Lord just simply arrested their vision, so to speak. And they did not know that he was the crucified, risen Christ. And he's walking right along with them. And in this conversation, 
um, he speaks to them, and they reply back to him, and they say, Art thou a stranger in these parts? Imagine. Now, Jesus was a stranger in this world, wasn't he? He, he wasn't from here, but he came here for you and me. He was a stranger here in this world. But he was not a stranger to what they were talking about. He's the very one they're talking about. He's the subject matter. They're talking about him, and him is right beside them, and they don't know who he is. Why? Because their eyes have been seized, arrested. Their eyes were holding. And finally the Lord said, Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe. Or not Christ who have uh, suffered, according to the prophets, or not Christ to have suffered and entered into his glory. And it was getting toward the end of the day. And as they reached the place where the two were going to stop, Christ made as if he would go a little further. But the Bible says they constrained him to come in. That's a wonderful word in the Bible. It's a strong word. It means they uh, compelled him. They persuaded him. Uh, they left no doubt they wanted him to stop and spend some more time with them. And to me, that's the difference between a genuine invitation and a courtesy invitation. You know the difference, right? You know what it says, come see me sometime. That's courtesy invitation. Well, I don't doubt they mean it, but, you know, they're not too serious about it. But when somebody says, Brother Lawrence, could you come see us next week? Uh, how about Wednesday night? Uh, about 7 o'clock. We'll have supper for you. You're constraining me big time. If you don't promise me supper, I'm on the way. <laughs> yeah, I am persuaded that you're serious about that invitation. So they constrained him, and sure enough, he stayed with them, came in there, and they sat down, and he's the guest, but he takes over. And he takes the food there, and he blesses it. And when he does, he vanishes out of their sight. And the Bible says, did not our hearts burn within us while he was yet with us and opened unto us the scriptures? Their hearts burned. Now, there's a heartburn you don't want. You know, you got to take a lot of Tums for. You don't want that heartburn, right? But I tell you what, one thing that's lacking among God's people today is heartburn. I'm talking about spiritual heartburn. We need a heartburn, don't we? We need to be in services where our hearts are just burning with excitement and burning with love and burning with compassion and burning with enthusiasm. Uh, I, I think we've had a little heartburn here this weekend, if I'm not deceived. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of heartburn we all need. And so the Lord opened their eyes. Their eyes now were open. First of all, the Lord uh, arrested their eyes. Their eyes were holding. Now their eyes are open. The Lord's opened their eyes. And what a blessing it was when they recognized, hey, we've been talking with the crucified and risen Christ. He was with us. He opened up the scriptures unto us. And then we find later in, the, in this chapter where he opened up their understanding to the things of the scriptures concerning him out of Moses and out of you know, the prophets, the, you know, the law and the Psalms. Uh, concerning himself. So the Lord is this great eye specialist that I'm talking to you about here. Uh, one uh, 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 part of scripture over here in the book of Numbers, I'd like to go to just for a moment, has to do with a man by the name of Balaam. Now, Balaam, uh, he, he's kind of an odd, odd fellow. There are times that Balaam says things that just amazes you. And other times you just think, you know, <laughs> he's just a greedy prophet. But anyway, we find where Balaam wanted to go uh, with the men who represented Balak. And uh, the Lord had given him instructions about that, but he violated it. And now he's riding an ass going, and we find where the Lord sends an angel. And the angel appears before the ass that Balaam's on. The ass sees him, Balaam doesn't. The Lord allows the ass to see something that he does not allow Balaam to see. Balaam can't see the angel. The angel appears three times, three times the ass balks, uh, the third time, he crushed Balaam's foot against a rock. And Balaam got so mad, he pulled his sword out and was going to, you know, uh, abuse the animal. And then the Bible says that God opened up the mouth of the ass. And he began to speak to Balaam. And, and that's a miracle, right? But another miracle is that Balaam started talking to the ass. And we got a two-way conversation going here. Can you, can you just see yourself standing over the side and seeing this man on this animal and they're talking to each other? <laughs> you see, Balaam is such, so, so enraged about the whole matter, he doesn't even realize what he's doing. He's talking to an animal that he's been riding here. And the Lord then opened his eyes. And then he saw the angel. And he saw what the Lord had closed his eyes to. See, the Lord is an eye specialist, isn't he? Now, David says, Lord, open thou mine eyes, I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. In the book of uh, 2 uh, Kings chapter 6, you'll find where the king of Syria had set an ambush 
for the king of Israel. But Elijah was, uh, Elisha rather, was a prophet there, and he warns the king of Israel about the plan of the king of Syria. Not once, not twice, several times. So finally the king of Syria thinks, well, said, I got a traitor in the camp. This servant said, no, you don't have a traitor in the camp. Says, there's a man of God over there in the camp of Israel that he's telling the king everything you're thinking in your bedchamber. Everything you're thinking while you're in your bedchamber, not even saying out loud, you're just thinking it, and the prophet knows it, and he's telling the king about it. He says, well, I'm going to send an army down there and get that guy. Now, think about that a minute. If Elijah knew the ambush of the king of Syria for the king of Israel, don't you think he's going to know about the army that's supposed to come get him? You know, but see, men in the world, they're just blind to these things. And so he sends an army down there, and Elijah has a prophet. And the prophet of Elijah, excuse me, a servant. And the servant looks out, and he sees this army of horses and chariots, and he's greatly afraid. And he comes to Elisha, and he says, Alas, my master. And he tells him what he saw. And Elisha says unto him, Fear not, there's more with us than be with them. What do what he thought? What do what the servant thought? He done done some counting. And he looks out there and he sees a multitude of an army of, of horses and chariots. And he looks out and he just sees him and Elisha. And Elisha says, there's more with us to be with him. I don't know what went through the man's mind. But then Elisha done something else that's very important. He prayed for the man and he prayed that God would open his eyes. Open his eyes that he might see. And the Lord answered that. And he looks again. He sees another army. And this army is horses and chariots of fire. That makes a difference. The enemy is horses and chariots. God's army is horses, chariots, and fire. And they surround Elisha, which means the enemy of the, uh, uh, the army of the enemy has got to get through God's army to get to Elisha. That ain't going to happen. He says he's round about Elisha. You, get, you know, when you're traveling, you go to some of these roundabouts. <laughs> I'm not sure I like them and I hate them at the same time. You know, because I usually wind up at my find myself coming around about right where I went into it at. I missed my turn somehow or another. Uh, but I guess they're beneficial once you get used to them. But God's roundabouts work better. He's roundabout Elisha with his protective hand, and they can't get to Elisha because God's army is around him. David says in another psalm, he says, of the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so I'm round about my people to put their trust in me. Now, I like to think about the roundabout arms of God, don't you? You know, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, The eternal God is our refuge, and underneath are his everlasting arms. Uh, I like to think about the everlasting arms of God from time to time, how they can reach all the way down from heaven and take care of me and draw me up and draw me close. You know, uh, in, in Isaiah, it says, The Lord's hand is not waxed short, and he cannot save. His ear is not too heavy, he cannot hear. I may, may mention briefly last night that we don't believe in a short-armed God. And this might say, how long is God's arms? Well, they're long enough to reach your case. I'll just tell you that. They were long enough to reach down. To, in the case of Saul of Tarsus, is able to reach down. In the case of the thief on the cross, they was able to reach all the way down from heaven to my case and take care of me. And so I love the arms of God that can reach under and reach around and pull you in close to him and close and tight to him and give you the comfort that you're in the hands of one that nobody can ever get you out of. So God specializes in this eyesight. But there's another type of eyesight I'll mention to you. And we find it in the case of Moses. You come to Hebrews chapter 11, and you'll find where Moses, by faith, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now this ought to teach all of us that choices are important. And here's a choice that Moses made that on the surface looks like it's a bad choice as far as the natural man's concerned. Listen to what he said again. By faith, Moses chose not to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That meant fame, that meant power, that meant riches. But rather than choose to suffer afflictions with the people of God. Who wants afflictions? <laughs> well, Moses thought it was better to do that. He esteemed the reproach of Christ, greater riches and all the treasures in Egypt. And he said, by faith, he fled Egypt fearing not the king as seeing him that was invisible. Now, how can you see the invisible? With the eye of faith, right? I've never seen the Lord Jesus Christ in my natural eyes, but I believe I've had some wonderful views of him with my eye of faith. And by an eye of faith, Moses saw what Pharaoh couldn't see. 
And Moses fled, not because of the fear of the king. He endured, the Bible says, because he was able to see him that was invisible. Paul prayed for this kind of understanding, this kind of view to the Ephesians. You go to Ephesians chapter 1, and you find where Paul is praying that their eyes of their understanding might be enlightened. They might know what is the hope of your calling, or his calling, rather. And that you might know about the inheritance of the saints in light. And uh, you might understand something about the great power that enables you to believe. He says, what is the great, exceeding greatness of this power to us who believe according to the work of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead? The reason you can believe this afternoon is because resurrection power abides in your heart. Resurrection power abides in you. The same power that raised Christ from the dead enables you to see with your uh, the eye of faith, enables you to believe in a God, my friends, uh, uh, that you have never seen in your natural eyes, but you know in your heart that he exists. You know in your heart that he's there. You know in your heart he has answered your prayers. You know in your heart he's reached down from heaven and strengthened you and give you courage. When you were weak, he strengthened you. When you were uh, fearful, he gave you courage. When you were confused, he gave you clarity and gave you the right pathway to walk here in this world. You know he's there. You know he's there. And Paul prayed this church, their eyes or their understanding might be enlightened. So David prays. He said, Lord, open thou mine eyes. I think that's what he's asking for here. Open thou mine eyes, that I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Now, in this book right here are wondrous things. I mean, unbelievable things. <laughs> uh, extraordinary things like we spoke about last night. In fact, this book itself is a thing of wonder, isn't it? Uh, God had this book written over a span of about 1,500 years by 40-plus different individuals. Uh, over this period of time, and yet everything they wrote harmonizes with everything every, the rest of them wrote. It's amazing, the harmony of this book here, this uniqueness of this book. It's an amazing book. It is a miraculous book, how that God had it recorded, and we still have it today. You look in Psalms 12, 6, and 7 again. It says, uh, for the words of the Lord are pure words, the silver purified, and the furnace of earth purified seven times. He said, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. That's why we have it today. God has preserved it. Somebody said, Well, I can understand about the scriptures being by the inspiration of God. I can see how God inspired them in the beginning and had them recorded. But it's been hundreds of years. Surely error has crept in since then. No, surely it has not crept in since then. Uh, because God in his power and his providence has kept it out of there. I mean, if God can raise my body from the grave, and I'm banking on that. <laughs> if God can raise my body from the grave and take me to glory, I don't think he's got any problem keeping air out of this book. Do you? And that seems like a minor thing to me compared to what I just said. So we believe in divine inspiration of Scripture. We believe in the uh, divine preservation of the Scripture. This book is a wonder to me. The more I read it, as I said last night, the more I realize how much there is to know and how little I know compared to what there is to know, there's no other book man could ever write that could come close to comparing to this book right here. This book is a wonder within itself. It harmonizes. All the writers harmonize together. But out of this book, we find where David says, Lord, open thou mine eyes. I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Now, the last verse in the 73rd Psalm uh, next, uh, close to the last verse, you're going to find where David says this. He says, O God, the God of Israel, only doest wondrous things. So everything God does is wondrous. Did you know one of his five names in Isaiah 9, 6 is wonderful? Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. His name should be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Wonderful means full of wonder. So wonder what David, wonder what David was wondering about when he said, Lord, open thou mine eyes, that I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Well, what about creation, for example? Notice how the Bible just starts off. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's a wonderful statement for me, as far as that's concerned, telling me there was a time when nothing existed, and then God just decided he's going to create the heaven and the earth, and he did it. Psalms 19 and 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firm that showeth his handiwork. Day and the day, other speech, and night and the night showeth knowledge. There is no place where their voice 
is not heard. All around this globe, people can look into the sky and get a message. They can get a message that there has to be a mastermind up there. There has to be omnipotent power up there. I think that's what Paul is saying in Romans 1. He says, when invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. That sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? But it's not. The invisible things of him are clearly seen by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Now, when I look into the sun, the moon, and the stars, uh, I see magnificence. I, I just, why do you think uh, when you see a rising sun that you have seen a billion times, <laughs> figuratively speaking, uh, you know, in this world, when you see another one, you say, wow, look at that sun. Look at that rising sun. Why do people go to great strides to see a sunset? You know, they want to make sure that we got to time it just right. You know, the sun's going down. It's supposed to be a clear night, and uh, we'll see that sunset. How many sunsets have you seen in life? What could one more mean to you? Because it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's like you're seeing it for the very first time in your life. The very first time. The rising sun, the setting sun. How many times we go down the road and we see a full moon up there? And uh, I'll say, Karen, get a little closer. <laughs> I told you to look at that moon up there. <laughs> I looked at it how many times I've seen that beautiful moon. And yet one more time I look at it and I think, wow, that's magnificent. I don't think I've ever seen it quite like that. You know, because everything God makes is new. Everything. That's why he says his compassions are new. Uh, you know, his mercies are new every morning. Why are we not consumed, Jeremiah says. Uh, he says the, the mercies of God, his compassions are new every morning. You know, and when you get up in the morning, another day, another beautiful day, another sunrise, another sunset, the stars, how they glitter at night and the beauty of a, of a cloudless day. Oh, that's a great wonder. And it's described like that in the Bible. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 10, 12, for the Lord has made the earth by his power. And he has uh, created the um, world by his wisdom. And he stretched out the heavens by his understanding. There's wisdom in creation. There's understanding in creation. Uh, you know, it's, it's a wonder. And you know, another wonder, uh, I go out in my mailbox and all I get is bills and junk, right? But I've never got a bill from God yet. God has never sent me an energy bill. <laughs> Can you imagine what it would be? Uh, can you imagine what it would be? He never sent me a water bill. I came home from a trip uh, a couple months ago, and somebody, as a prank, I think, come beside my house and turned my water faucet wide open. And uh, I don't know how long it had been running. Boy, I had to get on the phone with a, a White House water in uh, Goodlesville City, one thing and another. Thankfully, they cut me a break on it <laughs> and uh, one thing and another. But I'm, that was going to be a high bill. But can you imagine the bill that God would send you? Here's your water bill, uh, son, for last month. Uh, of all that rain I gave you on your grass and on your gardens and on your fields, I sent you. No, it's free of charge. God gives it to us free of charge. He allows the sun to rise, free of charge. He allows the sun to set, free of charge. Oh, Lord, open thou mine eyes. Thou may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Just the way God describes his work of creation is a wonder. Then I, I think about the wonder of God's providence in, in life. Surely David could uh, uh, wonder at all those things as we can. And David didn't even have an entire Bible to read. We got an entire Bible to read. And we can one, read wondrous things out of that, right? The providential dealings of God with his children. You take the nation of Israel, for example, how they're down in, in Egyptian bondage. And God's going to bring them out of there without an army. God's going to send 10 plagues to defeat their 10 idols down there in the land of Egypt. And he's finally going to send them the death of the firstborn, the 10th and final plague. And Pharaoh's going to let them go. And they travel out there. And then Pharaoh and his army pursue them. And we find where the Lord tells Moses to stand still, stretch forth your rod toward the sea and tell the people to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And he sends a strong east wind blows upon the Red Sea. It parts two great walls of water. And the children of Israel march dry shot across to the other side. And the Egyptian army tries to follow suit. And God brings the two walls of water back and drowns them all. And the Bible says they look back and never saw their enemies ever again. Now that's a wonder to me. Now I read that. That's just a wonder. When I, when I read how the Hebrew children could be in a fire furnace for 
you know, uh, heated seven times hotter than normal. And the king looks in there and he says, we put three in, but I see four. And one's like in the son of God. And they're all walking around in there having fellowship uh, in a fiery furnace. And he is so hot that those who cast them in was consumed on the outside. And they never burned their uh, uh, hair on their head, never singed their hair. Their clothes didn't smell of smoke. <laughs> now, you know, you can walk in a store, a convenience store, and come back out, and you can tell you've been in a place where people smoking, right? It's all over your clothes. But here they're in a fiery furnace, no smoke on their clothes, no, no hair on their head is singed. Uh, they're perfectly okay. The, the fires just burn off the, the ropes on their hands and their feet, one thing and another, because they had a deliverer in there with them. They had one in there that was our shield from the fire, and his name was Jesus Christ. Now, that's a great wonder. Open thou mine eyes. Might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Somebody said, Brother Lawrence, you think that really happened? Of course it did. Daniel, that den of lions. How the Lord sent an angel, shut the mouth of the lion, that the lions that night. And the king, you know, first of all, he come to Daniel. He says, the God whom thou serves continue, he'll deliver thee. Then he wasn't quite so sure. He come back, says, is your God whom you serve continually able to deliver thee? And Daniel says, live forever, O king. I don't know why they said that, but he did. Uh, live forever, O king. He said, for God has sent his angel this night who shut the mouths of the lion, and I'm doing fine. Daniel got a good night's sleep. The king didn't. He's on the outside. Daniel's on the inside. Den of lions, lions that's going to crush the bodies of the enemy after this. I know they were not decrepit. I know they were not clawless nor toothless because that's exactly what happened. But that night, I believe David just got up beside one of them old lions, put his arm around her neck and said, good night, honey. And they just went to sleep. <laughs> that's the kind of peace and calmness God can give one of his children when they're going through the fires or trials and tribulations here in this world. You can just have peace in the midst of a storm. How can you do that? You say, well, you can, brother. Uh, you can do that. You can have peace in the midst of a storm. And that's what the Hebrew children had. That's what Daniel had. And I can obviously go on for a long time just in examples like that. Open thou mine eyes. I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. But I'd like to think about the wondrous love of Jesus. Don't we have a hymn that goes that way? What wondrous love is this? Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Wonder what the hymn writer had under consideration about that when he wrote it. What wondrous love is this? The love that Paul says in Ephesians 2 and 4 is a great love. Wherefore, when he loved us, when we were dead in trespasses and in sins, God in his mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us in this way. I'm going to tell you, I've already mentioned, but you by nature are unlovable, and I'm unlovable by nature. But God loved us when it was impossible to love somebody that way. What wondrous love is this? No wonder his name is called Wonderful. It's a constraining love. It's, it's uh, uh, you know, he, we, in Romans 5, he says, Hereby we perceive the love of God, that when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for sinners. He didn't die for the righteous. He didn't die for the good. He died for sinners. What wondrous love is this? Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul, it's just love beyond description, is it not? How God could love somebody like me. You know, I, I, I know a people, I, I believe I could, I mean, I just think I could see how God would love them when I don't consider their nature because I can see the love of God coming out of them, you see. But I think when I look at myself, I wonder sometimes, how could God love somebody like me that has fallen so short? He has been such a failure along uh, life's pathway, seemingly. And uh, having done all the things I need to do, one thing and another, what, how can God love me? The only thing I can say is, what wondrous love, O oh Lord, that you had for me. What wondrous love you sent in your son, Jesus Christ, to come down from heaven and go to Calvary and hang there suspended between heaven and earth and cry aloud, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He forsook the Son, that he might not forsake you. The Son laid his life down, died for you, paid the price for you, redeemed you, paid the atonement price, and one day you'll be with him in glory, all based upon the love of God, brother, an everlasting love. What wondrous love is this? Oh, my soul. But you know, David himself was a wonder. Psalm 71, 7, they said, I'm a wonder unto many. I know a few people like that. <laughs> But not, uh, I don't wonder about him like David's talking about. 
I'm a wonder unto many. David, that little lad, that little boy on the hillsides of Bethlehem, keeping his father's sheep as a young teenage boy. A bear came and tried to take one out of the flock. A lion came and tried to take one out of the flock. But David defended those lambs. He was determined not one lamb would be, be taken. That's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior was determined not one little lamb would ever be taken out of his hand. Not one little lamb would perish that the Father gave him, that he loved with an everlasting love, that he would save every single lamb. And David did that. And David, as a young teenage boy, defeated a lion and a bear with his own hands. And then he went to fight Goliath the giant. Again, a very young man. And I love how the story begins to unfold when Saul came to him and said, you're not, uh, you're not able to go out against this giant. He's a man of warfare. And David says, God who delivered me from the paw of the bear and the paw of the lion shall deliver me from this Philistine giant. David believed that God who could enable him to do what I've already mentioned could enable him to rise to the task. So Saul started putting his armor on him. And David started putting it on. And then he stopped and he says, I've not yet proved this. This is not how he fought his battles. He didn't fight his battles with that with human armor. He fought his battles by looking to the God of glory. And he said, I've not yet proved this. And he took it off. It didn't fit him. It didn't fit him literally. It didn't fit his experience, you see. There's a lot of things in life, brother, and you, the God's people are trying to wear it. It just don't fit. It just don't fit. Listen to your experience along life's pathway. Don't depend upon the clothing of intellect. Don't depend upon the clothing of, of man's wisdom. Don't depend upon the clothing of the, the, the things that this world will offer you in this life. Put all that aside and depend upon what's got you thus far along in life. Your dependence and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That fit. And David went out there with a sling and five smooth stones in his pouch. So I said, Real Lawrence, why did he have five? I think he thought he couldn't miss. <laughs> he might need a backup. <laughs> but really, I think that's all the pouch would hold. I think if it held 10, he'd put 10 in there. But I think it was just big enough to hold five, and he put five in there, and by faith, he took one out, and he slung it. And it found the forehead of the giant, and the giant was slain. I'm no David was an expert marksman, but I'm going to tell you one thing. Divine grace hurled that arrow, hurled that stone, and it found the mark that David was aiming. It found the head of that giant, and the giant was fallen, my friends. And David took his own sword, the giant's sword, and cut his head off. And victory belonged to David and the Israelites that day. He's a wonder. When I read the life of David, he's a wonder unto me. I'd like, for me, I'd like to live my life where people look at Brother Lawrence and say, he's just a wonder. <laughs> In a good way, you see. <laughs> Don't misunderstand. He's a wonder. And I'd like to look at people and think, I marvel at them so much. I think they're just a, a wonder. David said, Lord, open thou mine eyes, that I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. If you read the word of God and God answers your prayer like this, you're going to read some things that's going to thrill your heart and strengthen your soul and give you what you need to face the challenges of another day of life. This time I'm standing at number 329. If you'd like to come to this church, the baptism, come forward and let that be number 329. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that calls Oh, 